Okay, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Barry Tonkinson. I am the Director of Culinary Research and Development here at the Institute of Culinary Education. And welcome to our first ever online Elite Chef series, a series that's put together by us to bring in the world's best chefs into, um, into uh, our culinary school and talk to us and talk to our students and our alumni about their path, about their passion and about their food. I'm very, very excited today to welcome Chef Vineet Bhatia. Um, Chef Vineet is known as the father of progressive Indian cuisine. He has a huge global presence around the world, including 11 restaurants around the globe from Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, London, and Geneva, with his flagship restaurant actually inside Harrods in London. Uh, Chef, thank you very much for joining us. We're very excited to have you and to hear you talk about your culinary journey and to show us one of your wonderful dishes um, today. So thank you very much for joining us. How have you been? Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you for having me on board here. No, it's been fantastic. I think uh, the, the lockdown has been quite phenomenal for us. We've been very busy right. for the past four to five months. Uh, a lot has been happening in our field. Uh, Things like these, what we're doing, the live uh, sessions are very important. Uh, we used to do a lot of live sessions for our team across the globe uh, at various restaurants, just trying to make sure the team can actually learn. But uh, because the pandemic has actually become a lot more. So we tend to communicate a lot more through video sessions, through tutorials, try and teach the team, try and keep them motivated all the time, and try and also teach them at the same time. So uh, although we are on lockdown, we are still in progress of uh, teaching our teams across the board because life has to carry on, things have to carry on. Unfortunately for us, the Middle East has opened up. We have seven restaurants just across the Middle East. We've got three in Saudi, one in Bahrain, one in Qatar, and two in uh, UAE, both in Dubai. So those seven restaurants are already operational. So there's a constant progress going on. Many changes are happening all uh, online now. So, you know, we try to change things as we progress. Uh, London opened up on July the 4th uh, at Harrods. It's called Kama at Harrods, London. Uh, Geneva is shut down because of lockdown. Mumbai is shut down. Mauritius is shut down. Other than that, I think we all up and going. Uh, it's been tough for everybody, but I think uh, it's been importantly that we understand what is required nowadays. Right. What do people require? And uh, things like these are very important, very instrumental for progress. So I'm glad to be here and uh, hopefully I can showcase you something which you guys can actually learn today, pick up a few things as we cook along. Uh, love to answer as many questions as possible. So whatever questions you guys have, please ask. Uh, knowledge is there for sharing. And we love to teach, we love to share. So as many questions, there is no question which is small, no question which is big, just ask. Uh, I will try and do you a dish based on a lobster today. Uh, if you don't have lobster, you can use a piece of fish or you can also use uh, poultry or chicken or if you're vegetarians, you can add some vegetables to make it work. But the whole idea for today's class is actually to make you understand the use of spice and how to actually use spice in your cooking, in your daily routine. If you want to incorporate certain spices, how do you do it? So I'll try and demystify the, the entire, entire process, process of spicing and, and take it on from there. Fantastic. Does that sound good? That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And I think it's really important what you were saying about having to continue and carry on, even in a world where uh, things are completely different now. and We're going into a new a new phase of reaching people through media like this. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it's fantastic that, we're, for example, we're able to have you and to, to, to share your, uh, your path and your passion and your, and your food with us. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, uh, I remember the last time we talked um, and, um, we, you know, I said to you, what have you been up to? And not many people come back with the response that you did, which was a huge list of things that you've been do doing and continuing around the world, right? Um, uh, so you're, you're, you've been really, really busy and you continue to be busy every single day. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit, Chef, about um, where everything started for you? Where was the genesis of your culinary path? And sort of give us a a brief snapshot, because I know you, 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 you've been so busy with so many things, but a brief snapshot about some of the highlights in your career so far. Okay, uh, I am from Mumbai, originally Bombay, that's where I grew up. And as a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly and go in the sky. Uh, unfortunately, I was too short to go to the Air Force and to learn flying. Uh, so I ended up in a hotel school. 
And I went to a photo school. Uh, I wanted to be a barman. I wanted to make drinks and cocktails. And when I went for my bar training in the hotel, I was told I'm too short to stand behind a bar counter. So they actually put me in the kitchen. Okay. And I just fell in love with it. I walked into the kitchen. This was way back in 1985. And I saw the way they were operating, how the kitchen was kept so nicely and clean, very methodical, very regimental, full of discipline. And I just loved that. So from that day, I decided to actually learn to cook. So 1985 was when I began my career in the kitchen and I wanted to become a cook and learn to cook. Uh, for my family, they were all into engineers or doctors or in defense services. I was the first black sheep as such to go into hospitality in those days. It was a big taboo of going into whole industry. All the discards were going in there and the kitchen was the last thing everybody, anybody wanted to go to. So that is how my love for food began. I was a very light eater as a kid. I would run away from food. I would only eat food to get enough energy to go and play. Uh, but when I got into the industry, I realized the passion I had, the enjoyment I got, the joy I got out of cooking, and the pleasure you got to see from the point of view of the guests when they enjoyed the meal. That made my day. So I knew I wanted to learn to cook, and I wanted to cook. So I did my three years of hotel school in Mumbai, yeah. and I was selected by the Obrai Hotels in India. And they only handpick around uh, 12 to 14 students all over India and then they train you for a further two years. So it is like doing masters in culinary arts and that is what I did. Uh, in those two years, I promise you, I hardly took any days off. I would end up doing 16, 18 hours a day just because I wanted to learn. I was just greedy for knowledge and that's what I did. I learned, I learned, I learned. And then I came back to Bombay after doing my training and I worked in the hotel from 1990 to 93. And uh, that is where I left and I moved to London. And uh, when I moved to London in 93, uh, I had a few options. I had job offers in Tokyo, I had job offers in Bangkok, I had uh, Dubai and I had London. I actually chose London, not because of anything else, but because of the Heathrow Airport. I wanted to see aircrafts, I wanted to see planes. I just love planes, I love engines. Yeah. So I came to London purely to see aeroplanes and not to really cook. But then I realized when I came in here, what was being served as an Indian cuisine was not a true representation of what you get back in India or the way I was trained. So I had to adapt. I could not call a chicken tikka or a butter chicken as a butter chicken because they would not understand the kind of tradition in those days, way back in 93. So I had to change my wordings. I had to change my menu and narrations. And when you change the narration, you also look at changing the way you present the food. So we started presenting food in a very different manner, very, very contemporary, very, very Western style. And that is what the people liked. So when you actually look at the dish which I put onto the plate, it looks very modern, it looks very Western style. But when you eat with your eyes closed, it's India on your palate. And that is the most important thing for me. And that is exactly what I want to show you today of how you put food onto a plate and make it look beautiful, but still elegant and flavorful. That is the key. Simplicity is very important. So we try and use very few ingredients and let those flavors sink through. And that is key with food. The flavors have to be impactful. They have to have intensity. They have to have clarity. And the quality has to be good. And that is going to be the key for the food to do well. Because as a guest, when you get something in front of you, the first thing is you look at it. It's your senses, your eyes, it's the aromas. It's the smells, and then you go into textures and taste and temperatures, and it all works together. So all the senses are very important when you actually eat, but they're also equally important when you actually cook food. And that is how you actually prepare food, which is going to make your soul feel happy. I mean, your soul feels happy, it brings a big smile to your face. Right. So you know you've done a good job. Yeah. We, um, we talked uh, briefly about it previously, but... Um when you're talking about spices, and you touched on this just now, and I'm sure you're going to go through the whole thing with us with your, with your demonstration, but the importance, the critical importance of, of spicing and layering flavor, right? Yeah. Um, because in Indian cuisine, there's, there's, there's nowhere to hide. You have, these, you have these wonderful ingredients, but if you don't treat them correctly, they don't stand yeah. up to their full potential. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you actually use spices, there are three stages to use spice. And if you get those three stages right, you get the basic understanding of use of spice. The very first stage is when you actually use whole spices. So whole spices means cloves, cardamom, cinnamon, fennel, black pepper, green cardamom, black cardamom, 
anything, anything whole spices. spices. Now, all the whole spices have got natural oils in them and have got enzymes. They only release their flavors when you warm them up or when you heat them up. Right. So the very first stage is when you heat oil and you add spice into it. I have seen most chefs around the world, they would add oil into a pan and without heating the oil, they would add in the spices. Mm -hmm. Now that is the very wrong way of doing it. You always heat up your oil to the medium heat right. and then you add spice. So when you add in your cumin seeds or you add mustard seeds or you add uh, green cardamom or whatever it is, the spices with the heat, they open up, they crackle, they pop, they open up. Now as soon as they open up, they release their flavors into the oil. And that is how you bully flavors out of spice. Right. And when you get the flavors out of the spice, it's released into the oil. So the oil is getting flavored. So that is the very first stage of actually extracting flavors from the spices. If you cook your spice for too long in the oil, it will burn and it will become bitter. Right. And you can't rectify that. That is gone. It's dead. Chuck it in the bin and start again. Okay. But to prevent it from burning, you need to add something which has a moisture content. So generally, you will end up putting some onion, some garlic, or some green chili. That's what you would add into it, just to make sure that you put the temperature of the oil down and the spice does not burn. Right. So that is the very first stage. The second stage is when you add powdered spices. Mm -hmm. And trust me, there are only four powdered spices you need to know. There is turmeric powder. Yeah. There is red chili powder. Yeah. There is cumin powder. And, and there's coriander, coriander powder, powder, just four spices. Now, if, if you, you don't, don't like it spicy, you can cut down chili altogether. But the turmeric gives it a yellow shade to the dish. Yeah. The cumin and coriander are dark spices, so they make a darker shade to the dish. So think in terms of your wine. Red wine with red meat, white wine with white meat and fish. Okay. So the same principle you can apply in some of the dishes also with food. So a darker meat or a darker colored sauce would have darker spices. A lighter meat with lighter, lighter spices, spices. Right. so on those, those bases. bases but these four spices actually form your soul or the character for the dish and these are added after you add in your wet ingredients like your onions and tomatoes or a piece of poultry or whatever you want to add into it right. so they bind it together and because they're in a powder form they mix quite well they homogenize extremely well and it forms the under soul or the base for your indian dish and, and the, the very, very last stage is when you actually add garam masala powder. Now, garam masala powder is basically whole spices which are pre-roasted and they're ground into a very fine powder. Now, because they are pre-roasted and ground, they're already cooked in some manner, but they are very aromatic. So when you add it into a dish, you add it at the very last stage of your dish. It's like a seasoning at the end. You sprinkle that at the very last stage, you stir it in, off the heat, put a lid and put it aside. Very much like when you use butter to flavor a sauce at the, at the end, when you monte your butter, when you add butter last to a sauce or to a soup, you add the butter last off the heat, stir it in and take it off so it doesn't split. The same way the garam masala powder works, it is only for aroma, it has very less flavor in it. Now for a very, a very simple example is when you're going out to a function, so you have your shower, you get ready, you put your powders, makeup, whatever on and before you leave your home, you put some perfume, works fine. This aroma, the same thing with garam masala. You don't put perfume and go and have a shower. You have it at the end. Right. The same principle applies for garam masala powder. Right. So I'll repeat that once again. It's a very important step. The first step is when you add your whole spices into warm oil or hot oil to release the flavors. That's only whole spices. The second stage is the four powder spices, cumin powder, coriander powder, red chili powder, and turmeric powder. And the last stage is when you finish the dish off, you add garam masala powder. So today when I cook for you, I'm going to use just one spice, black mustard seeds. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you how this one spice can actually transform the entire dish. You don't need to add 15 spices to make your Indian dishes. They are certain recipes, yes, but when you go into Indian homes back in India or homes around the world, Indian homes, they don't add too many spices in their food. Right. They add just a few. Right. And that is exactly what I do to my food in my restaurant. We add just enough what is required to complement the flavor. So in this case, it is a lobster. The start of the dish is a lobster. So the lobster flavor has to be the most dominant flavor. The rest things are just accompanying it for it to work in harmony, right. for it to work together. That's really interesting that you say that because I feel like a lot of people get um, deterred 
from trying to cook Indian food in general just because they're like, oh, I have to go and get 15 spices and this, that, and the other. And, uh, and it's quite daunting, you know, having to go to the store and buy all of these, yeah. all these spices that you may only need half a teaspoon, quarter of a teaspoon, whatever, right? But what you're saying is not really the case. Like, more spices doesn't mean more flavor necessarily. It's more about no. how your, your, your technique, understanding heat, understanding time, uh, so understanding time and temperature and using those in the correct forms. And then yes. you can get the maximum out of a very few ingredients. Is that right? Absolutely. That's, That's the, the best, best way to make it work. work. Less is always more. There yeah, are certain so recipes, recipes where you do add a lot more spices. spices. Yeah. But, but the, the best thing for someone who's a novice or new in this, uh, this spices spice to understand is to start on a very simple platform and just three spices, spices into your larder or into your cupboard and use them. And when you get more comfortable... Well, you can actually keep adding more spices. I mean, I have a box here, which is my spice box. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, can you see that? Uh, not yet. I think it's just switching over. Give me one second. So I've got turmeric powder. I've got red chili powder. I've got coriander powder. I've got cumin powder. I have a garam masala and I have a blend of spices here. I've also got the red chilies which were lying here, which I've taken out for the dish. Just to show you, that is the basic spice blend. And all these spices in the box, and I cook every day. You know, three meals a day I'm cooking at home, and I try to make Indian as often as I can. This amount of spices will probably last me for a good six weeks. It's okay. more than enough. It's okay. actually more than enough for, for six weeks. weeks. So, so that, that is, is what we're going to use. use. Right. But today, today we're just going to use red chili powder. powder. Just, just one of this. this. Okay. All right, so, um, Chef, the dish you're doing today, uh, lobster. Are we still there? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, Barry. Okay, good. Um, so the, the dish we're doing today, uh, lobster, tomato, coconut sauce, and upma, right? Yeah. Can you just talk us through a little bit yeah. about, about the dish and how you, how you came to create this dish and what it means to you in terms of your career? Okay. Uh, the dish is a grilled lobster. It's got a flavoring of a chili and garlic, and it's served on a bed of an upma. Now, umpa is actually a breakfast dish from South India. It is something like uh, it's made out of semolina. It is like a soft polenta, like a creamy polenta, but it's got lots of flavor. Now, because semolina does not have much flavor of its own, it absorbs a lot of flavors in, and that is where the spices come handy. And also, as a, as a starch, it holds quite well onto the plate. You can shape it up and, and give, give a height. height. So, so when you're actually planning a dish, all these are very important. important. And to contrast with the flavors of the very delicate uh, upma or the semolina, I'm, I'm going to make a tomato-based tomato sauce. So it is just a tomato, tomato passata with coconut, coconut milk. Uh, so, so the, the sauce, sauce can actually work, work for somebody who's a vegan, vegan for example. Okay. So, so now when people walk into a restaurant and say, I'm a vegan, can I have a vegan dish? And a lot of chefs go off balance. How do I do a vegan dish all of a sudden? For us, it is very easy actually because the sauce can be vegan. Uh, the upma can be vegan and we change the topping. So all we do is we either put tofu or we just do cauliflower steaks or a grilled aubergines or whatever and you get a fantastic okay. vegetarian option or a vegan option. So those are very important. So when you actually plan the dishes, you plan them in such a way that you can actually have a very diverse uh, spectrum of your guest profile who can come and enjoy it. And the clarity has to come through in terms of flavors. So the tomato sauce has got uh, coconut, coconut milk, milk, so you, you don't, don't need to add extra butter, butter. So, so you don't, don't make the dish heavy, right. but still at the same time, the creaminess of the coconut gives you a very nice mouthfeel, the natural fat sticks onto your lips, and that makes you very more, it makes you want to eat more. Uh, the upma is very easy eating, so it's very soft in a way, it blends quite well. Uh, lobster is very delicate, so you want flavors for it to match together. So all these things are taken into account when you plan a dish, and all of this comes under the entire menu as such. So when you plan your menus, it could be a tasting menu or it could be a, an a la carte menu. So you plan the menus as per what you think that when a table of four walks in and all four order different things, they have to have four very distinct flavors onto the table at the same time. It will be four different dishes. And that is key because when you come to a restaurant and you have a meal and you leave with a happy memory, that is the most important thing because that is what brings your guests back. Right. Because they've enjoyed the meal, right, and right. that is key. That that guest satisfaction has to come through. Absolutely, absolutely. And and is this a dish that you serve all around the world, or is it in just in certain parts of the world? How do you how do you decide 
which dishes out of your global restaurants? Um, it, you know, is it dependent on uh, ingredients and all that kind of thing, or do you have certain dishes that you use all over the world? Certain things become like a benchmark. Certain things like our uh, grilled lamb chops with pomegranate and pistachio, they work around the world. Uh, the chocolate samosas, the flaky crusted biryanis, the home smoked tandoori salmon, the lobster dish always works well. Uh, now again, it all depends upon the location where you are. If I am sitting in uh, Geneva in the month of December or in the month of Jan when it is snowing and it is very heavy and wintry and cold, I would not put fish on the menu. Because firstly, you will not get it fresh. The lake Geneva almost freezes off and you won't get any fish as such. So it's very uh, uh, difficult for it to uh, work on those places. So in those times, you add more red meats onto the menu, you add games onto the menu. But when you go to a place like Mauritius, it is all tropical around the year. So you don't want venison and pigeon and wild boar on the menu because it's not going to be consumed. It's too warm. So you're trying to do things which are, uh, which are as it is fine. Uh, is the top camera working? Um, okay. Anyway, yeah. uh, just going back, and also when you're sitting in the Middle East, in the Middle East, they have a lot of lamb. They're not really vegetarian, so most of the menu is devised on non-vegetarian, especially lamb. When you go to India, the whole thing changes altogether because 80% of the population are vegetarians. Right. So there's more vegetarian on the menu in India than probably non-veg. So each location will have his own issues and own preferences on what the menu profiles are going to be. And that's all based on our the guest profile who come and dine. And, but yes, there are a few things which are like a benchmark and they probably expect them into a restaurant all the time. So when you walk into a restaurant and you see a certain menu styling, the way the menu is written down, they would know that's a Vinit Bhatia restaurant or that is the way he works and that's the way he cooks. Right. So that becomes pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I, I think that's great. Um, and, and thank you for clarifying that about spicing before um, we get into this today. I think you know, we can talk a little bit more and, and sort of see the process as it's cooking. But um, I think that's sure. invaluable for people to understand. Um, you know, and, and especially take away that, that um, fear, I guess, that, that some people have about, about delving into a new cuisine. Uh, that might seem a little scary. You're saying, hey, you don't need to have all of these things. You just need to understand basic technique um, and understand True. you know how to how to treat a few ingredients and I think that's something that's really really important and, and hopefully it will mean more people out there will go ahead and and, and get into this and, and try try it a little bit more and be more adventurous so thank you for that pleasure uh, I think if I must start off the dish I'll first talk about uh, chilies uh, yeah. and spices I said earlier less is always more yeah. if you're not into chili you can actually take out all the chili from your food. If I have to have food in my home back in India when I was growing up, I wasn't a big into chili eater. Mm -hmm. I was having good flavorful food. Spice food does not mean chili hot. Spice food means flavors. Right. It's got the garam masala, it's got the whole spice. That is spiced. When it comes to piquancy, that is the chili factor, that is where your red chilies and green chilies come into picture. Mm -hmm. uh, some people just can't handle that chili factor. So it's best to take it off. Okay. Start on a very gentle note on a very low intensity of heat and then as you get used to it you can always increase it also when you're cooking it you can add a small quantity of chili if you need to add more you can always add more the issue is how do you take it off in case the food becomes a little more spicy hot in chili hot the best way to tone it down is by adding some lemon juice or anything citric lime juice lemon juice or adding yogurt into it it mellows it down right that is that is one trip the marinade for this lobster is actually chili and garlic. Now uh, it's a very bold thing to say chili and garlic because they're both very strong in their flavor. I have got this red chili here. Mm -hmm. So I've got whole red chili which have been dried. And the best way to actually use them is to actually blanch it into hot water or soak it into hot water for 30 minutes. When it's soaked into hot water 30 minutes, it becomes soft. And when they become soft, they lose their potency a bit. They become less spicy. Right. They also become soft, so it's very easy to puree them. Mm -hmm. So you put the chili into a food processor along with some fresh cloves of garlic, a tiny quantity of salt, and a little water, and you blitz it till you get it fine paste. So you get it literally into very fine puree as such of a chili. And that's what I have here. Okay. 
I've got this paste which is literally red chili and garlic which I've blessed together. So once you make this, you can add a small quantity of oil, you can leave it into a jar, into a fridge, it will last you for a month without a problem. You can put them into small Ziploc bags, you can put them into freezer, they will last you for a longer time. Perfectly okay. Now because you're blanching the chilies, the spice level, the chili fact that comes down because they're being cooked in the hot water. So they become slightly on the sweeter side and a small little kick at the end. So it's not too overpoweringly strong. So the best way to make a marinade is little oil, mm -hmm. a tiny quantity of salt. As simple as that. Just mix it together. So this is your base marinade. Now if you're using a, say a tofu or a halloumi or a cheese or something, that could work perfectly well as a flavoring. Something which is quite flat. A piece of chicken breast can also work quite well. But the intensity is there but it is not too sharp. If you want to add herbs, you can add rosemary, you can add tarragon as your choice. You like cilantro or coriander, you can add that into it. Now there is a trick here which I always tell all my uh, students or my chefs. And then you have a piece of lobster. I'm using a spiny lobster today, so just a lobster tail. And I've taken the lobster of the shell. I've opened it up. And this is important because when you actually cook the lobster, you cook from the shell and from the top. But this part just cooks through, but it does not get any flavor. So it's very important that the flavor goes in. So all you do is you take the marinade, you rub it on the shell, and you put it back. and a little more marinade on the lobster. You don't need to put any citric or lemon anything into it because if you add lemon, it will begin to cook the lobster. It will make it very tender. And the lobster, Same thing. the lobster is completely raw at this point. It hasn't been blanched or anything, right? Not at all. It is totally raw. It's a completely raw lobster tail. Yeah. Uh, if you want to use scampi or you want to use shrimps or whatever, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you use the same principle when you're using into a, a fish. So if you have a piece of cod or a sea bass, even that would work well. But I wanted to show you the lobster because a lot of people actually don't do this process of actually adding flavor between the shell and the flesh. And that is where you actually, when you heat, when you're heating into the pan, the flavor is from the shell also impart flavors to the lobster right. and it cooks through. So what you get is a very nice, rich, deeper flavor. Right. Uh, uh, cooking is all about uh, technique, it's all about how much flavor can you add, how much flavor can you extract and how best can the combinations work. Now if you want to put in, you can probably put in some chopped dill leaves here, chopped coriander or cilantro or you want to add any of the spice or any herb you like can be added now. Uh, if you like it spicier, you know, feel free. Add more chili if you want to add more chili. That's that's so really that's really interesting that you're doing uh, that you're doing this. I think uh, you know a, a lot of a lot of recipes call for removing the lobster meat and then marinating it, and then using yes. the and then using the shells um, later to make a stock or something. But here you're doing yes. it, you're doing both. You're combining both the flavor from uh, yes. you know you're marinating it completely without losing any flavor, like you said and you're using the, the flavor from the, sh the, the shells themselves. So you're kind of doing two things at yeah. once there. That's great. Yeah, it, it is important. So all that flavor has to come in, uh, in contact. But when you actually, idly, you would leave that for a good 10 to 12 minutes, not for longer because it's a very soft meat. Right. doesn't have any uh, binding together. It's a pure raw lobster meat, so it cooks quite fast. Mm -hmm. So you don't put it in the marinade for too long. So the good thing with seafood is that it really cooks quite instantly. Yeah. And the best way to cook a shellfish is on the shell because that gives the best flavor. So when you put it onto the pan with the heat, the flavors are released into the pan, into the oil. The same as you do with the spice. So the flavors come through quite well. And when you cook something on that pan, don't wash that pan. Take it off and add like a deglaze the pan. So all the flavors. So I'm going to cook the lobster in this pan and in the same pan, I will then do my sauce. So the flavor of the sauce comes through. Now, whenever you have spare shells or whatever, that can be used to make the sauce also. So when you're making the sauce, you can actually add the shells into the sauce and you cook the sauce with the shells and then strain it out. So what you get is a very intense, strong, 
like a lobster bisque almost. You can have a strong flavor of lobster comes through. And that is the most delightful part of the dish. You know, the flavor is so strong. Fantastic. When you actually heat food, uh, never start with a cold pan. Always start with a warm pan. So when you warm the pan, it is all set. Also, I've taken a heavy bottom pan. So the heavy bottom pans always hold the heat well. If you have a very thin bottom pan, it tends to get hot very fast and it burns the food literally inside. Even on a lower temperature or medium heat, the spices and the vegetables begin to burn. So when you have a heavy bottom pan, it holds the heat very evenly, right from the bottom to the sides. So if you look at the curves of the pan are very important. They're not straight, they're quite slanted, they're like a sorty pan. So just slightly curves in and they hold whole heat well. Right. For me, the best pans to use are cast iron pans, but the induction will not take that. So I'm okay with this one right now. So this should be okay. This is a heavy one. Now, uh, normally we used to working on a, a gas uh, cookers or gas burners, so you actually get to see the heat. The problem with induction or electric tops are you don't get to see the heat because you don't feel the heat. You don't see the live heat or the live flames. So it can be very misleading. And the best way to judge it is by the heat on the palm. So what I always do is try and put my hand on top of the palm to try and feel the heat. So once this gets a bit hot, you know that the pan is hot or the oil is hot. This is just about getting warm. In goes in the oil. Now oil is again a personal preference what you like to have. Any cooking oil which you like to use is fine. I like to use uh, brave seed oil. This is the best oil I think which works across the board for me. But you can use an olive oil, you can use a sunflower oil or a corn oil. The choice is all yours. There is no right, there is no wrong. But don't use a flavored oil. A non-flavored oil always works best. Because there is enough flavor coming in the dishes all together. So we'll wait for the oil to get slightly warm. And how much oil do you normally use? Does it depend on the amount of spices that you're toasting at that point? Yes. I mean, this is probably a tablespoon of oil. And because they are the non-stick pans, they use a less quantity of fat. Right. So the whole thing is, you know, eating habits have changed a lot. With the advent of the internet, everything is on the net. You spend time on the computer. You don't go out. You don't exercise. You don't go to the fields. You don't walk. You don't uh, you take an Uber. You don't uh, walk around. You don't cycle around. So we tend to eat also wrong. So whenever we try and cook, we try and cook with less amount of fat, less amount of oil. Just try and be a bit more conscious of what you are. Try and be a bit more healthy. This is nice and warm. In goes in the lobster. As soon as you put the lobster down, you are now cooking with your senses. You are hearing. Now you can see the flame coming in. That means it's a bit too high. So immediately I lower the heat. But there's enough heat in the pan to start cooking the lobster. As soon as you start cooking the lobster with the shell side down, remember I told you, between the shell and the flesh, I pulled it up to add the spices. Now as the shell cooks through, the chili and the garlic begin to warm up and they heat up. And as they heat up, they also cook the under part of the lobster, which is next to the shell, and it begins to cook it. Now as it begins to cook, it begins to flavor. So the flavor from the garlic and the chili is now going through into the lobster meat and it will slightly shrink up. The meat will come together, which is perfectly okay. And when you see it being cooked, you can actually hear the sounds. You can hear the sound, you can see the bubbling of the oil on the side. Yeah. And the color of the shell will change. Once it starts to cook, it will become more orangish. And that's when you associate it with the cooked uh, shell as a bean. It's almost cooking on one side. Also, all the oil in the pan has all the flavors of the lobster. Now, unfortunately, you cannot actually smell this, but for me, when I stand, when I cook, my senses are always telling me that it is cooking through, because the aroma of the lobster are coming through. I can smell the smell of the lobster. It really takes you back to the sea, literally. There you are. You see that? Yeah. It becomes nice and orange. So that tells you that it's being cooked. A 
again, a piece of lobster or a piece of fish is so delicate. When you're actually cooking fish, if you're having a bass or a cod, you can see that the under part which hits onto the pan, it begins to cook and the color changes from being almost opaque, it turns white. Right. And when the fish comes to half a level when it's white, you slip it over and cook the second side. That way, both the sides get perfectly cooked and the center is just about right. So you always get a perfectly cooked fish. So when you observe the fish and when you cook it, it's very important that you are using your senses and the technique of your aromas, the smell, the taste, all come into play. Fantastic. So what? So what are you starting to smell now? You've got the flavor from the from the lobster and the shells coming through, and you're getting the the the, 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 the warm um, chili and garlic coming through. But I can't get you. I can't hear myself here. I couldn't hear you, Barry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, good. So you're getting the flavor of the the, the lobster through the shells and the flesh, and the chili and garlic are all coming together now. Yes. They all come in together now, as the heat is cooking the lobster shell, the flavors are coming through. And then you flip it over to the second side, the flesh side. So what happens is, the outside of the flesh also begins to seal. And there, you can see it now? Yeah. It is just seared the outside. Now this is just about right. Sometimes what we also do is, we make a flavored butter. So once the whole dish is done, we actually add a little butter in the whole pan okay. and we flavor the pan, the, the butter with the drippings or the, the glazing of the pan and then we uh, cool down the butter, we have a nice lobster flavored butter in that. Oh, beautiful. And that could go into soups or it can go into, uh, uh, if you're doing a risotto, it can go into a risotto, if you're doing a pulao, it can go into a pulao, it will work well. That looks amazing already. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. And the best part is because you removed it from the shell, it's very easy to eat. Sometimes what happens is the lobster really sticks on to the shell, the meat, and you have to take it out with a fork and a knife. In this way, it literally peel out. Right. And Chef, how, show how, you. how important is yeah. it to use the, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this, but how, how important is it for you to use the, the best quality ingredients when you're doing something that's so simple like this? Uh, see, when you have a good quality product, you should always buy the best product you can get yeah. and you do bare minimum to it. But when you're cooking with the best products, you only have to give it enough to add flavor to it, you know, camouflage it. Right. So that's what food should be about. Unfortunately, most Indian restaurants would add tons of spices and you go down to an Indian restaurant and you order for lobster, you don't know what you're eating. It could be a jumbo prawn for God's sake, you would never know. Right. Because they doubt them. Or the envelope that has so many spices and flavors that you can't taste the flesh of the shellfish. Right, right. So it's important to, it, keep, to keep like, the integrity of whatever you're using. Keep it, yes. It's very important that you keep the flavors intact. Right. Okay. This is done. I switch off the heat. Yeah. And I'm going to transfer the lobster into a, a tray. Now again, at this stage, if you want to add any flavored butter, you can add flavored butter. It works quite well. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping the pan intact. And this goes into an oven at a holding temperature. So I just put my oven lights on. There's a very low temperature just to keep it warm. Okay. You get things like a whole room mat where you maintain temperature at 75 degrees. You can also do that. Right. But I'm just keeping the lights on as warm enough. Mm -hmm. And in this same pan, I will now make my sauce. A little oil. So you keep all of that residual flavor in there. All from, in there, yes. Yeah. But not at a very high heat, at a lower heat now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add just one spice, mustard seeds. Mm -hmm. now, mustard seeds, you get the three varieties. You get the yellow mustard seeds, the red mustard seeds, and the black mustard seeds. The black ones are the best. The reds are almost similar, but slightly less in flavor. And the yellow mustard seeds are only for salads. They're more for color and visual. They really don't work much. They don't have much flavor in them. Okay. So in this, I will now add a tiny quantity of so, so the mustard, mustard seeds. Seed. So the mustard seeds differ in um, intensity, but do they? Do, they do. And what about the actual um, flavor profile themselves in, in, in terms of how each one tastes? Uh, the blacks are the best. Yeah. 
the black mustard seeds have the most intense flavor. Okay. Then the reds, I would say 100% is black. Then the reds are more 75 to 80. The yellow ones are literally at 30 to 35. They're very light. Right. They don't taste much. When you add the mustard seeds into the oil, they begin to pop. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they begin to pop and crackle, that is when they release their flavors out. Right. So if you, remember I told you earlier, you add them into a warm oil. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It is slightly now beginning to pop. Yeah. Uh, normally when we cook, we cook a much in a much faster way. But because I'm slowing it down for your, for or even enjoy watching it and to learn, I put the heat on a lower heat. Right. Generally, it would have been popped by now and I would be adding more spices. Mm -hmm. But that is fine. Just going to scrape off the pans from the sides. Now also when you add the spice, they release the flavors. And mm -hmm. that is, you can actually smell the mustard seeds. Mm -hmm. Then goes in garlic. Yeah. Tiny quantity of garlic. Just, just regular chopped garlic? Just regular chopped garlic. Yeah. I would say half a clove of garlic. Ginger. Mm -hmm. Fresh ginger. Ginger works extremely well with seafood. Lightly saute that, and as you saute it, all the flavors from the lobster are back into the oil. Red chili powder, again, a quarter of a teaspoon of red chili powder. Mm -hmm. If you like it spicy, you can always add more chili, that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add that's tomato passata. Mm -hmm. so just Tomatoes from a can, literally. I'm not using anything from a fresh. I right. want you to see how easy it is. So you don't really need to go out and look for 10 different things around your house yeah. to try and make the sauce. Now, yeah. in this, if you have spare lobster shell, they could have gone inside or any shellfish could have gone inside and cooked with that. So it gives a very nice flavor. Right. Salt. To lower the heat because it's going to bubble away rapidly. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I've used a canned product here, I need to bring it to a boil gently because it's got preservative. So we want the preservative flavors to go off. Right. So just toss it all together. Now also remember the flavor profile of tomatoes. Tomatoes has got a very high umami content. So just mix it together. We to bring it to a boil. This is almost done. And then coconut milk. Mm -hmm. Now this is thick coconut milk. Okay. I'm using a canned coconut milk. Mm -hmm. When I began my career way back in 1985, the, one of the very first jobs I was given in my catering college was 200 brown coconuts. <laughs> to, to crack them open. Oh no. And grade them. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I mean, we had a machine to grade them, so it worked, it was a bit easier. Yeah. But then I had to pass it through a cloth and squeeze out the water. Right. And you get the first extract. And that, Barry, is the best coconut milk you'll ever have. Yeah. It is thick, it is sweet, and it is coconutty. It right. was such a nice flavor, this mm -hmm. rich coconut flavor. Uh, but things have changed. You can now go and buy a can of coconut which can probably give the same thing. So all those four to five hours of breaking <laughs> coconut and trying to extract, you get them in 30 seconds we're opening a can now. Right, right. So try and do things which are easier. I mean, you shouldn't be get put off by cooking food. It should be fun. Mm -hmm. Right. The sauce is almost done. And the most important thing is taste. You have to taste as you go. A little salt. And that is it. So, this so is what I get here is a very strong flavor of tomato. Yeah. And then there's a mustard seed, there is garlic, and there's a small hint of the lobster mm -hmm. at the very last. Mm -hmm. it's because it was grilled in the same pan. So you've got so you've got a good bit of balance here in terms of Yeah. Um you met you mentioned the tomato having uh, lots of umami, because uh, it has yeah. lots of glutamate. Um yeah. So you've got a good balance of umami and acidity from the tomatoes and the yes. spices that are working there. Um, 
I can I can I can almost smell it through the camera here. Yeah. If you actually thin this sauce down, yeah. you can actually serve it like a soup yeah. with some crusted bread. That is fantastic. Great. All the flavors are there. So a nice spiced tomato soup, but spice with mustard seed, not chili, right. not chili hot. So the sauce is done. That is super quick, right? It's not. Is, it's not as if you you're having it on the stove for twelve hours to develop flavor. It's it's all no. there. It is just clever cooking of how you balance flavors together. Yeah. Is how you put things together is very important, mm -hmm. and how you put it down together. A lot of people wonder when you work in the kitchen and you have hundred guests sitting in the dining room and you have a multi course menu and you have different things going on. How do you manage? You keep things organized. That's the mise en place. Right. And then when you put the table down, the food comes down. There are probably three chefs. Dressing up place at the last moment before it goes out, mm -hmm. and that is that the time factor is very important. How you have the whole thing put together, your team is very important. Right. Okay. The next part of the dish is the upma, which is the semolina. For the semolina, I'm going to use again mustard seed, but first I'm going to heat up my pan, and I've taken a flat pan this time, like a large sauté pan, because. There is more moisture going in here, so the sauce, will, the, the the polenta or the semolina is going to bubble. So this is very similar to a creamy polenta in some some uh, shape or form. Okay. I am using a semolina which is slightly uh, coarser and not a very fine one. But any kind of semolina, you get the fine grade, you get the medium grade, and you get the coarse grade. Okay. Any one would work. The ratio is very easy. It is one part of semolina to three parts of liquid. And that is the golden uh, rule I use, and it always works. Again, a little bit of oil. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for this one to get hot. Now, before I do this dish, I want to explain to you about one little herb or leaf rather. It's called as a curry leaf. Mm -hmm. A curry leaf you get them on the coastal parts of India. So anything around the coast, these grow. These have a very Large quantity of natural oil in them, right. and they give a very nice flavor. Uh, very much available in south southern part of India on the peninsula, which is all around the water, and it gives a very good flavor. So most South Indian dishes would probably have curry leaves. Now, if you can't get curry leaves, you can do without it. It won't have the same flavor. But if you make a little effort, you can probably get them into a dry shape and form in the U.S. You'll be able to get it. I mean, I have friends in uh, California. Who actually grow their own curry leaves? Okay. And it, it does there. It is there. <laughs> you can get it. Right. Okay. Again, warm oil. You feel the heat. Mm -hmm. Black mustard seeds. I'm only using one whole spice. Now, as soon as I add the spice, it begins to pop and crackle, and you can hear it. Yeah. It's already talking to you. Yeah. So you know what to go next. So cook it for too long, it'll burn. So then goes in my garlic, yeah. ginger. Mm -hmm. So the same process is for the the sauce as well. Yes. Just stir it together. Then goes in sliced onion. I like to use the red onion because they have a stronger flavor. Okay. The white ones have a higher moisture content. And they're very watery. They take longer to cook. The red ones have got a lower moisture content, have a stronger flavor, and also when you cook them, they look better onto the dish. Right. Now you're you're cooking the aromatics like the the garlic and the ginger and the mustard seeds very very quickly. We're talking about seconds here, right? Are you, seconds. You're you're maintaining the the integrity of those those flavors instead of yes. cooking them for too long and completely changing them. If you cook them for too long, they will caramelize. They take the brown color. So right. when you add in a liquid. The dish color will change to more brownish because right. the natural color is going to liquid. Now I don't want to have a brown color dish here. I want it to be a light creamy color. So lightly just sweat them. So when you sweat your garlic, your ginger, the release of flavor, yeah, it will change them. So when you add the onions, you just sweat the onions to make them literally get the flavors released from the onions. Right. So once that is done, then goes in the curry leaves. Now, as soon as you add the curry leaves, the oil from the curry leaves are released into the mixture, and that is how you are imparting more flavor into the dish. And literally, 30-35 seconds. Then goes in the semolina. 
Now, the semolina is going to cook along with the moisture. You would lightly uh, roast it or toast it with the spices and the oil. And what is happening is, as you are roasting it into the pan, along with the oil, and the oil is already flavored. So all those flavors are actually being soaked by the semolina. So when you add in the liquid, it swells up, it absorbs flavors, at the same time it releases the flavors back into the liquid. Now if you cook the semolina for too long, it becomes very brown and a nutty kind of aroma. I don't want to reach that brown stage, I want to keep it slightly under the brown stage. So I would say just light golden or yellowish color. I prefer to use a coarse semolina here because it gives a very nice texture. Okay. If I use a very fine semolina, it becomes like a very smooth, uh, like a paste it becomes, like a mash. Gotcha. I don't want that kind of a texture, I want a bite. And that's also one reason why all the vegetables are cut into pieces, which when you actually eat, it hits your palate. Mm -hmm. So when you're actually eating, it is all again about senses. It, it tickles your palate. Uh, it makes it more interesting. You get multiple flavors happening and multiple textures happening into your palate. And that is what makes food more interesting. Fantastic. Crank up the heat slightly. Mm -hmm. Now again, if you look at the dish, there is not much oil at all in this. Mm -hmm. It's very low. Right. I have not used any butter or ghee or anything else. It's just oil. So this can easily work for even for a vegan. And the world is changing a lot. A lot of people are getting very conscious and going into vegan meals right. and vegetarian food. And this works extremely well. Right. Uh, in India, they would probably add lots of vegetables into it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes like a breakfast dish. So you can add carrot, beans, cauliflower, peas. They work well. Right. Really work well. Uh, when I first made this dish, I had an Indian lady who came in and she said, but this is a breakfast dish, why are you serving it with a fish? <laughs> uh, you're not doing the right thing. But when she actually ate the dish in entirety, she said, wow, that combination really works well. Is that is that something that's important to you? Um, I mean, you mentioned, uh, sorry, I mentioned that um, you are known as the father of progressive Indian cuisine. Um, mm -hmm. What does that mean to sort of push the traditional boundaries a little bit not in terms of taste maybe because because you, you said it has to has to remind you of home it has to remind you of india but in terms of just um exploring how to put things together and, and not being held to any sort of um uh, conformative restrictions or anything like that yeah i mean see, when i started learning to cook at a very early age you know at 24 i had left india yeah so i gained the experience only working to hotels <laughs> And uh, that's what I gained knowledge at. So I was not an expert in uh, all the cuisines of India, but I understood the basics quite well. So I would question a lot. Why do you add uh, 25 masalas and why do you add uh, so much of oil into a dish just because the guests feel it is expensive? That's not correct. So I started doing it very differently. I would uh, try and cook things which I eat as a child right. and how I would see food as a child. And that's how I realized that that is what the guests want to eat eventually. They want things which are much simpler but still flavorful. So when you eat with your eyes closed, it should sing of India onto your palate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to look. And you go to modernize the food. So that led to a small little change in the way I thought of food and the way we look at food now. And uh, it has uh, taken shape quite well globally. A lot of people around the world are now trying to copy it. Right. And I think uh, in many ways we were the pioneers or the mavericks in those days, in the mid-80s, right. early 90s, trying to do things which were... Uh, Properly done, but with a twist. Right. Okay, uh, the semolina has toasted quite well. It's got a very light color. Now goes in my liquid. I'm adding just water. Okay. You want to add vegetable stock, chicken stock, fish stock, your choice. You have to cook with what you have and what you enjoy. And that's the most important part of what does your family eat or what do your guests like to eat. So you incorporate that. Crank up the heat. So if you had, for example, if you had, if you if you, if if you are doing this with lobster, for example, and you have you happen to have lobster stock around, or, or or some sort of fish stock or something, you could use that instead, right? Yes, yes, you can, you should. If that's what you have and you want to use, feel free to use that. 
you can, you can use lobster stock or uh, you can even add lobster bisque into a slight amount for flavor. Okay. Perfectly okay. Perfectly okay. We try and do a neutral base in the restaurants is because uh, when somebody walks in and says I'm a vegetarian right. and I want something else or can you do me something else, then we have an option. Right. We okay. can convert this into a vegan dish, we could do a vegetarian out of this. So that is how. And because once you see the dish be done, it's a light cream in color. And the color is so neutral that you can actually very quickly change a dish and create something instantaneously. So now, for example, we have a, a puree of uh, broccoli or a puree of spinach or a puree of beetroot lying with us. So you add in a couple of uh, tablespoons of beetroot puree into uh, the upma and you get a wonderful pink beetroot flavor upma. Great. And the color is so mm -hmm. vibrant. So just on that on its own could be a dish as a side dish or a complement to a meal. Great. So all these things are important. So this is so, so oh. this this is um, sort of a base for other flavors, other colors, other textures to, to go into, right? Yeah, it has a lot of flavors of its own. Yeah, but it also takes flavors quite well. Okay, great. Then goes into seasoning, salt. Yeah. Now it may look as if it's got too much of liquid or moisture in them, but trust me. 1 is to 3 ratio works extremely well. So one part of semolina and three parts of the liquid is a perfect combination always works. This will swell up. Right. It will really become quite uh, light and fluffy. At this stage is bubbling so I reduce the heat down. Mm -hmm. And most chefs are very tempted at this stage to add butter into a dish. But please don't. <laughs> it's not required. It's really not required. Let why, it fully cook through. Why is that, chef? Why, why would the why would a lot of chefs just want to put a load of butter? Is that is that just to get a richness there? Yes, it's to get the richness, to get the luxury feel. See what happens is when you have any fat into your food, when you cook with fat or when you eat the fat, you don't see it actually, but it sticks to your lips. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a risotto with the parmesan and you have cream, butter, cheese, water in them, it sticks to your lips. So when you have a pudding or a dessert which is milky and uh, creamy, it's fat. When you have ice cream, it's got fat. So that all sticks to your lips mm -hmm. and it makes you very moorish. It makes you want to eat more. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel like eating more. But always remember, whatever is sticking onto your lips, sticks onto your hips. So <laughs> just be a bit careful. So that's why we, I try and avoid putting the butter at this stage or all together. Right. And because the dish also has a coconut, which has got its own natural fats and good fats, it's not required. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quickly taste the upma. Salt is fine. It just needs to cook a little more. So just going to wait for it to absorb the liquid. I can see it starting to sort of bind together and swell up now. Yes. Yeah. And you, you look at the colors, Barry. Yeah. It's got the green of the curry leaf. It's got the specks of the mustard seeds. It's got the pink of the onions. Yeah. Now, if I had cooked the onions a lot, and caramelize them, the color would have changed. Right. So say for example, I'm doing a, a Rogan Josh, which is a classic North Indian style uh, lamb, like a, a stew. Yeah. The color is like a goulash, is uh -huh. rich brown in color. Yeah. And that comes with the, with the use of onions, which have been brown or caramelized. Right. So when you add in your stock, your lamb stock into the dish, the color of the onions are released into the stock and you get a rich color. Mm -hmm. Also for a dish like a Rogan Josh, you use a lot of dark spices. So there's black caramel, there is coriander, there is cumin, so all the black spices are heavy. Mm -hmm. So this is almost there. Here, can you see the color? I see it. It's yeah. nice and creamy. Yeah. It's still got moisture in it. It will still get a little dry. Now, I personally love semolina. It's a very versatile ingredient. Mm -hmm. uh, I have done a savory version here, but you know, you could take away all these garlic, ginger, onion, curry leaves and mustard seeds and you can just add fennel seeds, add green cardamom, add maybe milk or coconut milk and you can do a dessert, it's called as a halwa. Okay. So most temples or offerings will offer this to their uh, devotees who come to worship. So it's called as a halwa, so it's more like a worship food okay. or prayer food. Gotcha. But again, the color is so neutral. Anything into this, you could add saffron and just make it a saffron color. Right. Uh, you can probably add a 
blue pea flower water, make it into a light blue color if you have to, if you want to. Or you can add a, a puree of tomato or sun dried tomato and make it a tomato opma. You can add wild mushroom, you can add uh, anything, morel, seps, porcinis into this. And we become like a wild mushroom upma and then you share off some truffles on top. You know, it's fantastic. It sure. takes flavor so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. Now you can see, it literally come into a stage where you are able to literally scoop it off. Mm -hmm. And a scooping off is important because that is important for plating the food. So normally Indian restaurants would probably make a rice dish or they use a potato dish as a base and then they layer the food up. But this is a great alternative. So you don't have to have rice or potatoes all the time. Mm -hmm. A semolina works extremely well. Fantastic. Yeah, this is now ready. I'm going to switch off the heat and let that rest for a couple of minutes. So that's going to continue cooking for a little bit, even off the heat, right? It'll, yeah, it'll keep absorbing the liquid. Okay. So I'm going to take it off and I'm just going to lightly clean up my area. Mm -hmm. I don't like a mess <laughs> and that's one thing we always tell our uh, team around the world that a cluttered mind is a cluttered table right. so always keep your area very clean mm -hmm. wherever you work so literally clean up so, you know we take pride in our guests coming into our kitchens in trying to meet the team at time we always encourage our guests to go to the kitchens and have a tour because you know, it just gives them more confidence of what we are, and right. we take great pride in what we do. Well, I, mean, I think I think it was interesting earlier when you said that when your first experiences in the kitchen, when you walked in and you saw the methodical nature and how clean yep. it was and that kind of thing. Um, that's something that, that that speaks to me as a chef as well. I think you can tell a lot about a chef or a kitchen or an operation based on if you go and see inside that kitchen and it's gleaming. The amount yep. of care that it takes to look yep. after a, just just the stoves or the kitchen or the the walls or the floor or whatever yep. it might be, you can you can then imagine the amount of care that's being put into each plate. And I think that's something that's really important. Yeah, you know, East and the Michelin comes every year. Once a year, they come and announce themselves that we are in the guide. Do you want to go in the guide? And you say yes or no. And obviously, you say yes. You want to go in the guide. The first thing they will do is they will go in the back of the house and look at the kitchens. Right. So they right. want to tour of the kitchens first. Right. Just to make sure that everything is the same as what they see outside. Mm -hmm. So the back of the house for me is more important than the front of the house. Mm -hmm. But right. that reflects the whole ideology of the restaurant. Right. And that filters off to the service side eventually. Yeah. Okay. So I've got this done. I'm going to quickly remove my lobster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plating, very, very essential. As a guest, when you sit down and the plate is put in front of you, the first thing nowadays which happens is you take out your phone <laughs> and you want to take a picture. Of course. 15 years back, it was a curse. And they would say, oh, it's not nice. You're destroying the food. But now it is the nature of the game. Yeah. Everything is on Instagram. Everything is social media. Yeah. And we actually encourage, we always say to our guest from day one, is your meal you enjoy but please don't let it get cold so don't spend half an hour taking pictures mm -hmm. take a quick picture but enjoy the meal right. and enjoy so when you think of a dish we spend a lot of our time and I keep saying we is because it is myself it is the team we work together we try and do things which are all done for the guest purposes mm -hmm. so try and look at crockery and cutlery which will match quite well and which is different so it's like when we had a tasting menu at a restaurant which is now closed down we closed two years back uh, we had a tasting menu of 15 courses and trust me just the cutlery and the crockery for per person was almost 300 pounds worth of what he ate from right. in those 15 courses because each crockery was custom made it was handmade specifically made because we wanted the guests to have the entire experience and I think for what we did back then for the restaurant which is called Vidit Bhatia London in less than a year we got a Michelin star which was a surprise you know, to have got such a short notice, a star, but everything was very detailed. Right. So for me, the cutlery, the crockery is very important. The colors are very important. The textures of the plates are very important because they all speak about the mindset of the restaurant. Yeah. So try and make a little effort and try and get a service way which matches the same way. Right. Look at contrasting colors and 
uh, textures for your dish. Now I've taken a black plate here because I've got the upma which is white, I've got a sauce which is red and I've got a lobster which is orange and whitish. <clears throat> so now to put the food down, it's a very basic kind of a setup, a presentation. Now the upma as you see is got a nice shape. Mm -hmm. It holds shape well. So I've got a canal of upma. Yeah. I've got the sauce here. So okay, instantly the plate begins to take, come to life. Mm -hmm. Got the lobster shell on the shell. So you serve it in the shell, right? Yes. I always serve a lobster in the shell because, you know, that has got all the flavors in. So when you actually take it off, all the oils start dripping down. Wonderful. All the flavors drip down. And that holds flavor. And you don't want to lose that flavor. But that is very important. It becomes a bit messy to eat, but a good seafood lover will always want to have is shellfish on the shell and right. not off the shell and that's the way I like to cook I like to serve I still remember when we opened our restaurant in Geneva in 2008 <clears throat> Paul Vaucous who's the father of uh, modern Nouvelle cuisine he came and dined and he said it is so nice to see and he had the lobster dish but it served a bit differently and it was on the shell and he was so pleased to see that actually food was served as it should be on right. the shell right. you know like meat on the bone has the best flavor the same way a shellfish on the shell has the best flavor. Right. A bit messy, but definitely worth it. But that's okay, right? It's 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 the experience of, of getting, yeah, it's experience. Getting, getting to know getting to know your food a little bit. Yeah. Right? Now again, I'm going to do a slight garnish on this. It's a very simple garnish. Yeah. I've taken these uh, rice noodles you get in normal uh, oriental shops. Mm -hmm. I've deep fried them till they're crispy. So literally flash fry them into hot oil mm -hmm. and they puff up. But what they also do is they get crispy, nice, light and crispy. Mm -hmm. So, because they are fluffy and light, they give the dish a little height. Mm -hmm. And finally, I've got these flowers from my garden. That's for the contrast and for the color. So there you have it. Beautiful. You have my chili garlic lobster with upma, tomato coconut sauce, crispy white noodles, and some flowers. Simple Thank and easy. Thank you so much. It looks absolutely fantastic. I wish I could be there right now and, uh, and taste it with you. Um, thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. It, it looks amazing. And I, I think um, what really stood out to me along, uh, along the, the cooking there is that like you said, it's not overly complicated. This is not, you know, you, you're doing things uh, using a technique. You're understanding when to add spice. You're understanding at what yep. temperature your pan should be. Yep. And, and you're using very, very few ingredients and ingredients that you're able to, everybody's able to get. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. And it, and it looks like um, an absolutely delicious dish. And um, I can't wait to, to, to try something just like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it myself. Um, no, no. Please you. try it in your own kitchen. That's important. The whole idea was to actually showcase Indian food and trying to demystify the use of spice and make you guys understand how spices can be used and not overloading with 10 different spices and making it very complicated. Right. I think best to start on a simple note. So when I say still a simple note, you still have used a very luxurious item or a good ingredient, but play around with the flavors and the technique. For me, the technique and the spicing is very important of the balancing is very important and that was the whole idea to spend those half an hour 40 minutes trying to make you guys understand and show it to you actually how it is done fantastic thank you so much um so there's a couple of there's lots of questions here there's a couple that that, that, that sure. um uh, actually about the dish so someone's asking if if you can recommend a non-shellfish 
fish for this instead of lobster? I think you mentioned a couple earlier, but what could you use if you didn't eat shellfish? Uh, you can use a sea bass. It works well. You can use a piece of cod. It works well. Uh, if you get monkfish, you can also use monkfish, barbecue the monkfish and put it on top. It works well. Right. But the safest one is to actually use a sea bass because it's quite flat. But when you're actually using a sea bass, try and use the sea bass with the skin on. Right. And when you have the skin on fillets, ask your fishmonger to fillet the fish and give it to you and clean it and pin bone it. The pin boning is important and scaling it off. Mm -hmm. But when you get your fish with you, make thin gashes on the skin side, literally half a centimeter wide, thin gashes. So when you cook the fish on the skin side, the skin becomes crispy. Gotcha. And when you then fold it over or toss it over, the flesh side cooks. And what you get is a perfectly crisp skin mm -hmm. and the gashes keeps the fish flat. It doesn't, uh, doesn't turn, it right. doesn't swell up. And you get a perfectly cooked fish. So a sea bass works well. Uh, use the same kind of a marinade. Uh, if you're not into chili, cut down the chili altogether. You can add some crushed garlic, some crushed ginger, add maybe some fresh dill leaves into it. It works well. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, we, again, some of these questions are coming up. I think um, you know some people may not have got the whole um, uh, um, the whole conversation. But um, someone's asking why you didn't use garam masala here. And I think we touched earlier on, on the fact that you don't need to add every single spice for every single dish. But what is the reason here? Um, what is the reason here that you kept very very cleanly with the, the mustard seed and the aromatics that you used? I mean, garam masala is generally works very well when you have a stew mm -hmm. or something like a curry. Because then you add it at the last and let it seep in. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, that only the liquid is the sauce and the sauce has got enough flavor in it. Now, if I add too many flavors into the sauce, it will camouflage the flavors of the tomato and the mustard seeds. So that's one reason why I added no garam masala at all. Mm -hmm. so, I stay clear. So it's a very clean dish. It's a very clean. When we eat this dish, I mean, the best thing to have with this dish is a, probably a glass of champagne or something sparkling right. or a dry white wine would work extremely well. Right. But it's a very clean. So when you have something with that, it leaves a very clean flavor. You don't want to end up having a meal and then you feel heavy and stodgy and your right. whole mouth is uh, empowered with 10 different spices. And for 10 days, you're just brushing your teeth together flavors off. Right. The good thing with the food which I cook is very light. Right. So you, you enjoy the meal with a good glass of wine. And when you finish it off, you still feel light and you want to go dancing. You yeah. don't feel heavy. <laughs> right. And I think that that's just something in general that the industry is is going towards now. Lighter, yeah. cleaner flavors, more um, understood flavors or understood ingredients. So that when you're tasting, when you're tasting a dish um, in yeah. any cuisine, right, that now diners are able to identify mm. those those flavors rather than it just being masked with so many different flavors that like in so many different ingredients that you can't decipher in your head what you're what yeah. you're actually tasting you know it's good or not but you don't know what you're yeah. actually tasting whereas i can imagine just based on me watching you cook this that you could really cleanly identify um all of these flavors yeah. um and that, that's i think that's really important um yeah the, 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 it's, sorry one thing it's yeah. very important that you know as 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 a cook or as a confident cook you know when to stop Right. You know when to pull back and when not to add. That's why I said you don't need to add the butter. There's enough natural fat. Most cooks will add the butter into straight away. But I restrain from them. I am quite confident in the dish what I have in front of me. I don't need to add more to it. So for me, less is always more. And right. when you have simple ingredients, it is a lot more difficult to cook with something which is more simple. Most people cannot get a simple dish right. They try and make it over complicated by adding too many things. But the simple dishes are the most difficult to get right. Right, that's yeah. I I, th I think, um, yeah. To your point about co about being a confident cook, right? Uh, a lot yeah. of people are saying now that you know when a you know when a dish is finished when there's nothing left that you can take away from it. Yeah. Right. Without it lo completely losing its identity. And the best part is, you know, for us as chefs in the restaurants, when the dishes come back from the table, when you see a very clean plate, that is you're the happiest then. So there's nothing left on the plate except the shells. And that tells you, you're doing something right. Right. Fantastic. Um, so, um, I just wanted, so, so, someone's got a question about um, in, in Indian cuisine in general. And I think you touched earlier when you said when you first came to London, um, there was um, examples of Indian cuisine that, had, that were um, popping up around London and sort of growing uh, around London at the time that wasn't really representative of 
true Indian cuisine, or, or not even in true Indian cuisine, but true Indian flavors, right? Mm. Um, has that changed? Uh, do, do, do you think that, that, that perceptions are changing um, in terms of, you know, what the old London curry house used to be compared to, 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 to a more um, understood version of Indian cuisine around the globe? It has changed a lot. And I think London has probably been the forefront in many ways in right. this. Uh, when I came in 93, you know, then to now in 27 years, I have seen the entire change happen literally in front of my eyes. And I think I've been a part of it, yeah. at the forefront of it, yeah. and actually started probably most of it, I would say. Uh, I got a lot of flack initially for what I did. <laughs> I used to get abused a lot by people, who, you're not doing the right Indian way. And I said, no, 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 you guys don't know the right Indian way. Uh, but what I started doing differently has now snowballed into something which is quite big yeah. and on a global platform now. So you know, it is now accepted as a mainstream or a top-end restaurant. I think we broke the barrier when we opened up Rasoi in 2004. One of the first reviews which came out in those days was 100 pounds for a curry and a question mark. Right. And everybody said, this guy is dead. Nobody's <laughs> going to go to the restaurant. It is too expensive. Yeah. I was the happiest. You know, We were so thrilled, my wife and I, we said, we have hit the boundary, we have crossed the 100 mark, right. I think there's no going back. Right. People were comparing us to the likes of Gordon Ramsay and to Nobu and stuff like those. Yeah. But they are the same price bracket. Yeah. And we are in the same area or where they are in central London. So if he's buying the same scholar from the same supplier who right. watched the price to me, why should I be charging less? Right. And you're in, you're, in, um, you're in Sloan Square in Chelsea, right? So for those, of, were, you, yeah. th those of you who know that, it's, it's an extremely expensive area. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, that's 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 really interesting. So so, it's interesting you say that you, you took a lot of flack from that, and a lot a lot of chefs say the same things when they're when they're at the forefront of changing yeah. um, concepts in food. Right at first, it's all criticism, and I think yeah. like Rene Redzepi in in Noma was the same. He got so much criticism when he op first opened up from his peers yeah. and from the general public. But sure. it, it, it's a case of sticking to your guns, which you obviously did, exactly. right? And and with 11 restaurants around the world uh, and and the success you've had, it, it's testament that you choosing the right thing and sticking to your to, to your heart is, is fantastic. And the biggest thing for us was in 2001 when we got the Michelin. And we were the first, I was the first Indian chef restaurant in the world to have bought it from a restaurant. Right. And you know, it, it opened up everybody's eyes and what is happening. You basically created history. You broke the glass ceiling for everyone to now start looking at Indian food differently. And now they are restaurants around the world have mission stars. But right. you, know, you needed that one little crack to happen and to open up for the whole world. I right. think that is what well, that is what this food did. It right. opened up people's mind that Indian food is not all about curry and rice. You know, if you go back to India and you, I used to get asked all the time, he said, uh, what curry do you recommend? And I was scratched when I said, you guys don't know. There is nothing like a curry in India. You walk into India into a restaurant. And you say you want a curry, they laugh at you, literally. Okay. So that is not Indian food. Uh -huh. It is just looks as Indian food from, from the Western point of view, but curry is not really an Indian uh, word. I mean, I got very offended when I first came in. I said, oh, you were from a curry house. Well, all you did was a curry house on a Friday night was have six pints of lager. Exactly. You had uh, six papadam, onion bhaji, and you broke a few <laughs> bottles because you were drunk. And you don't know right. what you ate. Right. Well, those days are gone, thank God. Right. Things have changed, not just in London, but... I think across the world, and I think yeah. uh, uh, chefs like us have been able to use the platform of what we have in trying to showcase this at a very high level internationally. So, you know, right from doing uh, Netflix shows, the final table, or to doing Master Chef, or to do uh, gourmet exhibitions and stuff like that, or be brand ambassadors at events. So, you know, this is what we do. We try and showcase. This is what I do in front of all of you. I do showcase Indian food at a very high level. Right. So, you, it makes you appreciate what good food is about. Right. It so happens to be Indian, and that's it. It's good food. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the fact that your sort of flagship restaurant being in, in, in Harrods is kind of, it's a huge thing, right? To have oh, an, an Kama, I mean, Kama at Harrods is the first Indian restaurant in 175 years at that iconic building. Right. And that to an Indian restaurant. Yeah. You know, you are there, the biggest, probably the most famous departmental store in the world, yeah. and you're serving Indian food. To a, an audience who are internationally traveled audience, I mean, yeah, I couldn't ask for a better showcase than that. Yeah, honestly, I couldn't ask for it. Yeah, it's great. Um, someone has a question um, uh, saying, uh, "Biggest concern with Indian food or dishes is plating, um, as Indian food is not considered to be 
like Instagram worthy or beautiful visually, right? Um, <laughs> you, obviously, obviously, you've broken that uh, that idea uh, with your cuisine um, as it's very visually appealing and uh, sort of touches all the senses. Um, yeah. How would you say is best to present or plate uh, Indian food, right? Would, would you say that to, to get away from the traditional boundaries of having, you know, your food in a bowl, rice next to it kind of thing, you can, you can still be creative, right? Yeah. I mean, you can still, see, there's nothing wrong with the classics. Classics, all the classics, they'll never change. Yeah. But say, for example, uh, you have a butter chicken. Mm-hmm. Butter chicken is probably the most famous Indian dish around the world. It right. is a beautiful chicken tikka into a red sauce. Everybody loves it. Mm-hmm. Why does it have to be red in the first place? Why can't you do a white butter chicken, for example? So, no, one of our dishes was a white butter chicken. We, we actually take the tomatoes and we actually put it into a cheesecloth with spices and we hang it overnight. So what you get out is the white liquid, the clear liquid right. next day in the morning. And that is the essence of tomatoes. So that tomato water, right? That's tomato water. Yeah. So you treat the tomato water the same way as you want to do the dish. Yeah. But you don't add the colored spices. But you add uh, dried milk. And you add cream, which you normally do add into a butter chicken. Mm-hmm. And what you get is a white tomato sauce. Now, I promise you, if you eat that dish with your eyes closed, you will say, that's butter chicken. Nothing wrong with that. But when you open it, you say, but where's the color? Right. So you're playing with the senses. So what we do is, I know, I understand that it is basically about curries and rice and kebabs and tikkas and samosa. It all works well. But you can still make that interesting. Mm-hmm. You can still make it look beautiful. Firstly, you don't put too much into the plate. You don't over garnish the plate with a lot many things happening around it. You try and do service wear or bowls of food which are very beautifully designed or nice colors in them, contrasting with the dish, and add a few elements as a garnish. You know, we do a tandoori lamb chop. We actually grill them on the char grill, and we serve it on a bed of mashed potato made out of saffron mash. So a saffron with a mash. So imagine the color, the golden saffron color. And we sprinkle on that pomegranate kernels, which is ruby red in color, Pistachios crust and rose petals. Right. That looks gorgeous. Right. And that's, that is that is a, it's a basically a tandoori lamb chop. Yeah. But it is just the way you assemble it together. Right. The flavor compositions is how you set a jigsaw, how you put things together. If you can match the flavors well and compose the dish, you want to a winner. Mm-hmm. And that is important. You know, you have a piece of bread. The bread is very flat. Nothing there in that. So you have a bread. But the bread is the base, and on top of that, you can have your skewers of lamb or the lamb kebab. The small little glaze of the lamb sauce, some pickled onions, and a couple of cress, and a few dots of chutney or dots of yogurt. Perfect. Right. Classic food. Yeah. Done well. Great. Thank you. Um, someone's asking, what kind of wine or cocktail would you serve with this dish? I think you said something very light, right? Uh, with this dish, something very light. I think if you're having a for me, the best drink to a company, Indian meal through and through, is the champagne. The champagne always works across with all kinds of dishes from Indian repertoire. It works well. So a, a bubbly would work well. Uh, a dry white would work well. Uh, also, if you want, if you're into a new into wine and something uh, light and fresh, I would say something like a grusamine works well. It's got a small amount of fruit to it. It's floral. It works well. So that can work well. It all boils down to what you like. I mean, there's no word of a lie, Barry. I have a guest coming into my restaurant who had a lobster dish and order for a claret with this. Are you wanting claret with a lobster? But that is his choice. That is what he likes to drink. So there is no right, there is no wrong. It is what you like to eat. I like to have champagne, so that's my personal preference. You could be probably wanting to have uh, Diet Coke, for example, with that. You know, it's your choice. Nothing wrong. This is what makes you feel comfortable. Right. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, Another question here. Um, what's your view on uh, Indian street food and its longevity when compared to hot cuisine? Oh, I, I love seafood. I am, I, I, I adore street food, any kind. And Indian street food is so deep. You know, it's, each state, each city has got its own kind of street food. Right. And I was sucker for street food. I enjoy it. I take that as inspiration and I put them into my restaurants. I try and elevate them into different styles and try to make it more interesting. So right from your Golgappas to your Pani Puris to your Bhel Puris to your Chaats to your Samosas. One of our biggest selling items in Harrods, in fact not just Harrods in London, 
and come about all the restaurant is our samosa chart. So we basically do vegetable samosas, the, the crispy triangle pyramids of wheat flour filled inside with the uh, potatoes and vegetables. And we serve it with a bed of chickpeas. So it's slow braised chickpeas with some onion, tomatoes and garlic. And then I'm old mouthy water when we talk of it. <laughs> we drizzle on top of that, we add a sweetened yogurt, yeah. tamarind chutney. Yeah. and green herb chutney and we sprinkle that with the gram flour vermicelli and that is a classic street food yeah. but I've combined two street foods into one and it is the biggest seller right. now, you people just love that it is so soul satisfying right. there's something very special about uh, street food because street food is what the masses eat most of the time because it is quite price sensitive it is what people love to eat this is the flavor they're used to having and those are the kind of flavors we try and replicate back into our restaurants and we add little twist and turns. There's a very classic dish in India, which is a, a puchka or a wheat bobble. And it's served basically with uh, sprouted lentils and potatoes and stuff, and they add spice water into it. You know, we take the same base, but we actually flavor uh, the shell, the bobble, instead of being light brown with a beetroot puree. So it's pink in color. So you can imagine a beautiful pink bobble. And that's got vegetables inside. So you could have corn, you could have avocados, sweetened yogurt. It's got some uh, sour spices. So it's a balance of temperatures, <clears throat> hot, cold, spicy, sweet, and the visual colors. So no, when you hit all those balances onto your senses, it knocks you out. It's amazing. Fantastic. And 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 something about street food, it just it. it it just speaks to culture, right? You can, I, I can imagine even just thinking about it right now. Um, yeah. It, it it's encapsulates cultures so much, not just in India, yeah. but in, in every country, I think. Um, yeah. and, and that's amazing. Um, that's true. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, uh, would you ever cook the semolina in wine? Like, for example, could you could you deglaze with a little like, white wine or something to put flavor in there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfectly fine to do that. Nothing wrong with that. It's a liquid. I mean, it gives with wine, it gives a nice flavor. So if that's what you like, you know, it's perfectly okay. I mean, in the past, when we did a thing with wild mushroom, we should soak, we should take a dried uh, mushroom and we should soak it into warm water. So what happens is uh, a lot of the flavors are in the water. So the water is used first to deglaze the pan. Okay. So all the mushroom flavor comes through and then you add in your other mushroom and you cook it together. So that is perfectly fine. So, you know, if you want to have, if you're accompanying this, say, with a, with a fillet of a lamb or a sliced beef or something, you want to serve with that, and you want to add red wine into the deglazing, perfectly fine. You know, add some red wine, reduce it down, and then add the assembly and cook it through. It'll give a deeper flavor. And th this is the good thing with food is you have to adapt it to where you are and what you like. Right. If I'm sitting into a vineyard and I have the access all around me and that's what the people are enjoying, I would do the same. I would definitely want to do that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, Couple more questions, Chef, if you don't mind. Sure, um, sure, sure. sure. With, with when you are talking about the amount of, of of projects and the amount of restaurants, and obviously your your, your work uh, recently on television with um, uh, the Final Table and Master Chef India, um, how important is it for you to have not only your team there to to see out your 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 vision, but consistency in a restaurant? Like, how important is that for you when you're overseeing such a global reach? I mean, we use technology a lot to help us in the restaurants, you know. Uh, in the olden days, you should be Skype all the time. So you're on Skype calls most of the time. But now with Zoom chats, with WhatsApp calling and all the stuff, it, it really works well. What we also do is uh, we, we have cameras all over the kitchens in all the restaurants. So we've got camera where we can operate. So I could be sitting in the Mauritius at work and uh, I could just be logging in trying to have a look of what goes on. So uh, that also works well. So technology is very important, and we like to share that. So we try to incorporate uh, uh, these these things here. Uh, each place has its own own uh, things happening around it. So some people have a different way of operating in different restaurants. But we try and make sure the team always works with us. So we have never gone outside and and poached anybody's chefs right. to work with us. We always have a team within us who have been growing. <clears throat> so if somebody asked me 15 years back. Uh, what is your vision? And I said, there is no vision. The vision was to open the restaurant, pay off the mortgage, pay off the staff and do a good restaurant. <laughs> then the Michelin comes through and everything comes through and it snowballs into something quite spectacular. Yeah. But this is not what we had planned. We right. were just focused in trying to deliver a very good product and a very good experience for our guest. Right. And I keep saying guest all the time because 
a lot of people address our diners as customers. They are not customers. We are in the hospitality industry. Right. We welcome the guests into our restaurants right. and we treat them as guests. And that is what it should be. It's hospitality. You look after your guests. Customers are okay for airlines and so supermarkets, but not for the industry. For the hospitality industry, it is all about guest satisfaction. So all the teams are handpicked. They're trained from within our team. And I have had people who have been with me since uh, 24 years, 25 years. They're right. still with me. And yeah. they have now grown up from being young cooks to then becoming into head chefs for the restaurants. Yeah. So they really grown. So when we appoint a chef or a manager to a restaurant, we literally we give him our house keys. That this is my house key. This is my restaurant key. You will look after it. So you are literally a part of us in many ways. Right. You are an extension of the family. So, yeah. And uh, the loyalty factor, touch wood for us, is pretty high. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, having, ha I think having loyalty within your within your staff and having having trust on your end as well for someone yeah. who obviously has so much going on that you're able uh, willing and able to trust someone completely and say hey like i trust you to do this job uh you know go ahead and do it that's that's impressive we, we also constantly motivate them you know we're always there we're always teaching them yeah. we're always a little umbrella on top of them to look after them so you know yeah. when somebody has an issue with the family back in india or wherever it is or he, he needs a little mortgage for his house or needs some extra money to, for the loan to be paid off. We are there. We want to help. We are always there as a backup support for him. Right. So the trust factor comes in. So now when you see a young kid who is probably 20, 21 who comes to you and he spent 15, 18 years and now he is married, he's got two little kids, he's got his own apartment, you know, it makes us feel happy also. It makes us feel nice. Right. That you're giving something back to the industry in some shape and form. Yeah. It's a little thank you. And that thing, thank you comes to you by giving him a chance to perform well. But at the same time, you know, he's also part of the whole thing, the ethos. He, he believes in what you have done. You've given them a platform. I mean, when we were starting off, we had nobody a uh, platform given to us. We had no mentors with us. We had nobody to guide us through. So I've seen those days when, uh, you know, you were shafted around with no one to look up to. So I knew whenever my turn came, I would not be one of those chefs who sat in the office and just gave orders. I don't even have an office. I don't even have a visiting card. I don't want one. I'm very happy on my shop floor in my kitchen. This is my kitchen studio at home and this is where I enjoy the most. I cook for all you guys. I do my Instagram feeds. I do my YouTube feeds from here. Uh, we will do our travel series very soon. Uh, fingers crossed. And uh, we'll try and showcase food in the, the finest way possible. In a very humble manner. That's what we are about. That's fantastic. And, and that's really inspirational to hear and something that I think that all of our students and, and our alumni would, you know, would love to hear and, and love to be a family, to be in a family just like that. So I think that's, that's... I mean, just that's a small little fantastic. note for all the people who are studying at ICE and stuff like those. I think these are the formative years for you guys. You know, you are right up to the age of 27, you're like a sponge, you're, in, you're absorbing information. And that right. is what molds you. So right from the age of 17, 16 or 18, when you join the industry and you go on working, till 27, you are actually still seeking information so those eight ten years are vitally important right and that is what makes you and molds you for the future so if you can spend that hours trying to educate yourself and gain knowledge that's going to help you for the next 40 years in life right because that is a basic foundations and you have to be the most loyal to yourself and most sincere to yourself yeah. the amount of effort you're going to put in the hard work you're going to put in to learn you're going to reap the benefits in the years to come it is for your own good so no you are sitting in a land where there is so much to learn and understand and with technology around you, please use that to your advantage. Right. Yeah, it's fine. And, and, and um, I was, you know, was going to say to you, like, what is your biggest bit of advice? But I think, I think you, know, you, you, you said earlier, like when you first, when you first sort of got into a professional setting, you were just every day, 16, 18 hours, just learning, learning, yeah. learning, 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 right? And it, it, I think it's sometimes it's difficult to see the end goal to see the the you know where am I going to be in ten years? Where am I going to be in fifteen years? Where am I going to be in twenty years? Right, but to start off with, uh, it's all about just educating not only not only at school, for example, with us or uh, learning in a kitchen or, or going to do stages or going to do extra work or extra help here, there, and, and everywhere. But reading books and constantly taking on information because it never ends, right? In terms of learning. Never ends. <laughs> you know, I've been working now for about 35, 37 years now and I can still yeah. say I'm still learning. Yeah. I still put in the hours. I still go in my kitchen and I work with my team. Yeah. 
I can't do all the dishes like I used to earlier because I've got held up with different things happening around me. My role has changed. But if I'm into a city in Dubai or if I'm Mumbai at work, I'm in my kitchen. You, know, you will not see me loitering around on the restaurant or mingling with the guests and uh, having a glass of wine or sitting in a bar in uniform. I never do that. If I'm in uniform, I'm in my kitchen. And that is my temple. That's my place of work. And that's what I do. I was still put in the hours and I still enjoy it. And that is because I think it's the passion which comes through. It's a genuine feeling of enjoyment of actually being in the in, in your surrounding which you're most comfortable in. And for me, my my chef clothes, my aprons and my equipments, uh, it's like a temple for me. My kitchen is my temple and this is what I enjoy the most. And I'm the most comfortable in my zone. Right. I'm the happiest in my zone is my kitchen. Right. Chef. I, I think that's a great sort of note to, to, to wrap up. And I want to I wanna thank you so much. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone here has really in, enjoyed it that's been watching. Um, thank you so much for, number one, sharing your, your food with us and your, um, your cuisine. Um, but thank you for, more importantly, I think, for, for, for everyone here, thank you for sharing your, your philosophy on, on the industry, on education, on learning, on... Uh, breaking culinary boundaries, changing culinary boundaries, um, uh, and, and everything in between. It's been a fantastic discussion, and, and, and thank you very much for being part of this uh, Elite Chef series that we have at the Institute of Culinary Education. Um, I, I appreciate it so much. Um, I, I think it's been invaluable, so thank you so much. Well, from my side, a big thank you to all of you for watching this, and uh, I hope you've taken a lot more from here and uh, use it into your daily routine of your lives. Yeah. And hopefully we go on to inspire tons and tons of more people around the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, next time I'm in London, I'm going to come and visit you. All right. And next time in New York, New York so. and when we can, when we can travel around, um, please come and visit us at, uh, at our campus. Um, for those I would you, love to. Yeah, that would be amazing, Chef. Um, for those of you who are watching, um, the recipe will be on the blog at um ice.edu forward slash blog and that will be live tomorrow so you can click on there to go and find that that's ice.edu forward slash blog um again chef big thanks huge thank you to you and i know all your team as well that, that are with you and help you set up and everything like that um so thank you very yeah. much to everyone guys those of you who are um watching and, and listening thank you so much for for joining us as well um chef it's been amazing uh, it's been fantastic um, nice and, and it's been a pleasure to host you so thank you very Likewise. much from me thank you and good night alright take care bye bye yes, good night